to the High Water event in January. And so John Spengler from ODFW is joining us. John's been a frequent presenter for us. He's worked for ODFW for 19 years. He's an OSU grad, and I would say a very proud OSU grad from the uh, ribbing he just gave me over where I graduated from. So um, we, please join me in welcoming John as he talks about the, uh, the large wave response. And some of that gets back to history and philosophy that people have. Um, some people just have a philosophy that large, freestanding wood, let it be flexible, let it interact with multiple flows, is the best way to go about it. Others feel that cabling is fine, it's a tool in our toolbox, and if we need it, we should use it. So in certain places, we should just let it be freestanding. In other places, there's really no option but to cable it. The problem is, is back in the 70s, 80s, we were getting short wood, it was large diameter, and the only thing we could do to keep it there was the cable. We had a lot of bedrock streams around. And one of the ways to get gravel back in a bedrock stream is put a log weir, rock weir across, capture up gravel, and then start rebuilding the process that way. So really, you know, there's we've changed and we've progressed in our thinking, and from going from large or small material, cable to bedrock or boulders to 120 foot trees blown in with a helicopter that become fairly stable and very flexible within a stream environment. So I went out today and I tried to get into some streams, get some photos. A lot of them are enclosed by trees, slides, uh, there's a bit of snow up in the hills. So I got what I could, but um, usually we'll go back in the summertime. You can really see the differences <laughs> changes then. It's a lot easier to get photos. So when we're looking at how things have really changed over the years, um, we used to look at streams and simply try to make the habitat that suited the fish for a particular life stage. Whether we needed gravel, rearing habitat. The thinking now is what is the watershed process is doing to develop, maintain, create that habitat for us without us having to keep going in and doing that. One way is just the breach horns. They come out with systems. They bring in all your sediments, your boulders, particularly <coughs> large wood. That just deposits right into the system and it'll start developing and maintaining its habitat on its own. So this is a slide that's up on uh, Sayuslaw River Road. It actually came right out of the canyon to deposit a huge amount of boulders right into the main stem. So it's a little bit misleading from the picture, but this is probably about 50, 60 feet out. And so the boulders are car-sized boulders that came out of that canyon. So one of the things is that's very much a natural process. That's what we want to get to and just let these systems function on their own. And they'll do a much better job, much cheaper than we can do it. But we can also go into a system, a spot like this, there's not a lot of complexity. You can put wood into it. It doesn't come in on its own. But you have no option here but to cable it. Um, the stream's 100 feet wide. You're not going to get a piece of wood to stay there that we can move. So cabling in these situations is very appropriate, I think. So another one of the processes where we get into some of the older styles of habitat work is there's a lot weirder down here stream is just kicking out a ton of gravel on high flow events. And those weirs incredibly effective at capturing up all that gravel and rebuilding these streams. And this was after the flood, it stayed there. So those older weirs are very stable. Um, log weirs, once they start filling up, they can be very stable and not get a lot of pressure on them. So I kind of pirated this bit from Leo's work up on Sayus Law. It's one of his main sim weirs. And uh, he went in last summer, um, extended this weir a little bit because the road point was setting up. And then he loaded it up with a lot of large wood over here. It's all cabled in. Um, you're not going to get anything to stay there that we can move. What we need to stay in these main sims would be those four to six foot diameter trees with root laws, 200 feet long. We're just not going to get those anytime soon. The problem, again, it's just a little bit closer to look. You can kind of see cables in here. These are just all cables, boulders, logs. It's just 
Same thing we did for a couple decades. After the flood, that's what it is. All of it's gone. You know, these really hard point structures that we put in there that cable these logs to boulders, they're not flexible. They take the full brunt of that river. And when it does that, they do they pull or they bust apart. And when they bust apart, they take off and they're gone. It's a short size for the river. So they will likely end up on the beach. So, you know, all of Leo's work that went into this, you know, that's gone. I don't know how you can really, you know, set these up any better. Um, part of where we look at putting wood in streams is where you, can you put it and it stays there. You know, where would wood naturally set up in these stream corridors? And at this site, this is on a straight stretch and it's taken the full brunt of the, the force of the water. And given the level of the flood, um, I can see why that material took off and moved. So this is some work that was done up on Whitaker Creek back in the 90s. Still there, still functioning. The one thing you can uh, take out of this is much smaller streams, much larger material, still cables, but it's also not interacting well. You haven't really created deeper pools, you haven't really captured up any gravels, any of the debris that comes down these systems, you just haven't really captured any of it up. But it stayed there, it's still creating some habitat, it's still functioning. But in time, even this material is going to break up, it's going to rot and take off. We've got this other trip. There's another weir and additional cable material. So at some point, as this wood rots and decays, it'll break up as well and take off, even if it stays here for another decade or two. So this is just another shot of uh, Whitaker Creek. Whitaker was done with, you know, like we talked about, those short sticks, uh, cable together. This is about the size of them, not even bank full width. When we get to those sizes, they're very mobile in the stream. Once they break loose, they can take off, they'll be out of the system very quickly. All of your investment is gone. So these uh, logs here, they came out in the January flood, positive here, the receding river levels. The next flood we get, they'll pick up again and move down the system. They don't stop anywhere, they'll just be into the main stem site you saw and gone. So, you know, all of this wood, you know, the big thing with wood, it's no different than fish, wildlife, or anything else. It has a migration all its own. <laughs> so it, it will take off, it's just its migration is a little different. A little slower usually. So if it doesn't kick it up on these little terraces here, the other place you'll get is the front end of these islands. And you can see there's one cut end log here and another one here. But uh, these front ends of the islands are very stable locations. I mean, those places will hold material for a long time. But then when it busts apart, you get a big movement all at once. But typically, these sites are places we would look at for a restoration project. They're stable, they can hold the material, and do some real good work during all flow conditions. So then when we get into kind of our current thinking on, you know, where do we put wood, how do we put it in, freestanding, you know, no cabling, no anchoring, much anchoring. This log here is anchored just between two alders. It's not roped in, cabled in or anything, it's just sitting in there with ballast on top of it. So the idea behind all this is during flood events, that material will actually lift up, be very flexible within the system and interacting with all flow types. So it, if it flexes, it's not taking that full force of the water. It can still scour some pools, still slow up the water, get it out on the floodplain. And it can just stick in the same place for a long time. The biggest thing here is we've gone from having small diameter, short pieces, to larger diameter, much longer pieces. That length gives the stability for the structures. 
And if these pick up and move, the log is going to go a short distance. It's going to go sideways. It's going to hit another tree, a bank, something, and stop for a while. We've had some structures that have simply picked up the whole structure, moved them down to the next one, and now we have them twice a day. And still functioning very well. But the system will tend to put this material where it can use it the best. If it's cable, it just doesn't function the same way in the stream system. Uh, this is one we did quite a few years ago up in Samson Creek, Drift Creek with Celeste. Very large system, about a 45 foot active channel, higher gradient. There was a lot of concern over you know, how we place this because the power of this stream we felt could simply break these trees in half and take the whole structure out. So we were very conservative, um, almost to the point of paranoia that we just didn't go after very aggressively. And the problem of putting these up high and not being aggressive is that they just don't function very well. They don't capture the material, the bed load, they don't create the habitat. We spent a lot of money doing it. We got to be very aggressive. So we actually were able to go back into the stream, add more material, move these logs around, the trees, and uh, it's now down right on the uh, stream bed and functioning much better. Yeah. This is one that we were very aggressive on, you know, right in the beginning. It was way up the base and we could get very aggressive with how we place it. Just we had about five miles downstream before we hit any kind of uh, infrastructure. And the structure is clear back here. This is about four to five feet of gravel that built up within about two years. And it was because we really bound that up very tightly. And then all the material coming out of this system just went in, got caught, and all the bed of the stock. This stream simply moved from here, where it was running into the boulders back here, to this side, where it kind of wiggled its way through. Wasn't a barrier to any migration, but it sure did a lot of good work. So we patterned the rest of the project on this one structure. That's how we did it. This was Drift Creek on the Celeste, the Samson Creek. So it's a pretty high grade power system. So I got to give a little credit to Jack Sleeper, he's a biologist for the Forest Service up in Walport. Called him up. He's been doing a lot of large wood placement for years. Very good at it. And he sent me down some of his photos that he took from this last year. And this one's on Canal Creek, uh, tributary of Lower Owl Sea. Real good system, but you can look at this as very simplified channel. Habitat's very poor, no stream complexity. For sound on it's we're just not going to get very many fish out of that. So he flew in all these logs. This is kind of that low flow period. You kind of really see how we place them. Very low in the stream channel, very complex. Then you start getting some moderate flows, and that really creates some very good habitat. But then we get this January flow. All of the logs are still there, still functioning really well. And it's kicking this stream up into here as well, backing it up on both sides. So that gives these fish ways to get out. And really, those long, large pieces have stayed put, they haven't mobilized, they flexed and moved and readjusted a little bit, but not that much. This is another one still on Canal Creek, and just during that flood event, um, I uh, just think that those bigger trees have done the number. Right? They, uh, we could definitely go back and put in small cable wood. It would not function the same. It would probably break apart. And you know what we have here is if that stream starts meandering in, which we always get to localize erosion points, that stream is going to continually hit on this wood. We've got a wood bank to bank almost. But that's still going to just going to creating, developing, maintaining habitat over time. So 
So the other thing that uh, all the wood does, aside from the complexity, which we all know that's what we want to see in these streams, a very complex stream, beneficial for coho, it's been identified in all the publications as a limiting factor for coho. But these big key logs capture all of this fine material coming down the system. And it's all that fine material, you know, fine um, debris, that really boggles these up, slows down the stream flows, drops out sediments, and creates all that slow water habitat. So when you look around these logs um, during high flows, you can always find these pockets of slow water. And within those areas, that's where you're going to find your fish. I think you can look back in here. All this gravel that's been deposited in fine sediments. You know, that's part of the process that we're looking for in um, material. Not that it stays put and it's hard and rigid, but that it flexes and interacts with the stream. This is functioning as natural as we can get it, slowing stream velocities, dropping out gravels, and just creating some of those off channel habitats that we're looking for. This is well after the flood. Um, Feel the same area up in Canal Creek. You can see this line here. You know, the stream was all the way out of its banks, up on top, all the fine silts and sands. They're dumped out onto the floodplain. What you're left with in the stream channel is some fairly clean gravel. And it's surprising how much fine sediment you know, a flood actually moves out of these systems, and just leaving behind some fairly clean gravel. So this one, um, when you get into really large projects and these long logs, you're not looking at capturing just the small little twigs and branches. You're looking at capturing, capturing these alder trees that break off, snap, come down. So you're looking at a whole different scale that I think over time we kind of saw a different vision, a different approach to how we look at watershed restoration and process. But again, it doesn't matter. You still are going to have wood movement. Whether you cable it, freestanding, wood's going to move. It's going to happen the same way. It's going to end up on the banks. It's going to end up at the head of islands. It will end up somewhere else in the base. That wood will move at some point. It's just when and how. And typically, it moves during flood events. It's going to move when it rots and breaks down and when you get landslides. So really the take home message that I want to get across here, not that cabling or freestanding is the best or most appropriate, each one has its place, but really that all wood is going to move. It really doesn't matter whether it's cabled or freestanding. The current thinking is we have to be freestanding, it functions much better within the river system and creates that habitat that we're looking for. Cable wood generally is going to take on that full force of the stream, and when it breaks apart, it's ripping and tearing apart, and it takes off and goes. And you get a 30-foot log going down the river, and it hits a bank, then it's going to do some damage. These very long logs, they're just not going to take off and run very far in smaller streams. It's, it's not going a short distance, stopping, waiting for the next flood event, and going a short distance. It takes off, and it just goes. So freestanding wood, like we talked about, it's got that flexibility. It moves up and down. It works within all different flows. And even back in the 80s, when I was in college, um, our professor had a video from H.J. Andrews Forest. And they showed it, and it was a debris jam, a natural debris jam, that basically floated up as the flows came up. And as the flows came down, the debris jam came down. It was really a cool video that very much said these systems operate different than what we had thought. Cabling wood to the bottom doesn't really work as well in the systems. Uh, it was much thought. So length, there's your stability. You can't really put wood in streams without having a very long tree. Twice the active channel width. If you can go longer, great. Bigger the diameter you get, great. Root wall, it's even better. So, 
they just simply are going to function more naturally within the system. It's great to have that we're looking for. So as far as this year, I've looked at several streams and it's variable. You get some streams that you can walk up and every structure that's in there is now gone. Other streams, nothing's happened to them. The structures are functioning perfectly. Other streams, it's a mixed bag. You'll have one structure gone, part of the structure gone, or it's functioning very well. So it's just the thing to keep in mind, streams are dynamic and they will go up and down side to side every year. That's about it. It was very quick, but uh, I didn't notice. I think things are functioning fairly well. From what I can tell. There's time for question and answer. Gary, I saw your hand first. <laughs> uh, just, I wonder what, it, what, it, what is your take on the state of the streams overall right now? Do they all need big wood in them? Or? Uh, as a general rule of thumb, all of them need more big wood, yes. So in, for the most part, big wood was taken out decades ago. Some of it was bulldozed and we're just trying to put it back the way it was. We're trying to get some complexity back in, which is really a band-aid approach until these natural processes take over, grow big trees, and fall in. You know, another interesting thing with the upper Sayuse law is that back in the 60s, there was an ODFW biologist that went through the system and systematically blew up every beaver dam out there. <laughs> now we know those were very important habitats to have. But uh, trying to get that habitat back and that component back is going to be very difficult. And then once the wood is gone, how long does it take to grow a six foot diameter tree? That's how long we've got to look at restoration. Tom and then Steve and George. Yeah. Uh, I looked at the structures on Deadwood Creek from the confluence of Cougar Creek up from the Bill Burns property. It was mostly long wood structures. Uh, intact. Um, I sent Paul Burns some pictures. You can see all the stuff you were talking about, the flexibility, the, 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 uh, the big logs. The only thing I, about that placement project is that I wish you would have used more logs. Mm -hmm. yeah, it seems to be one of the biggest downfalls we have. Is, you know, we do get kind of bound up in the cost of these problems. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> <laughs>
then as it settles down and the water slowing down catches more probably. Exactly. Vanessa and then Dave. Yeah. So I was wondering in all of these large replacement projects, has there been any studies done where you're actually going out tagging the trees in place and actually recording the movement there as is. they you know, move down through the stream network to compare and you know, does it work better in one stream order compared to another? Um, Jack Sleeper has a really good presentation on that. He did that in 96 on 10 Mile Creek just up the coast. Mm -hmm. That was one of the first helicopter projects we did. And he tagged every stick. And what he's found is they will break. You get a certain you know, size of stream, and you're breaking 20 inch diameter trees. So he's found most of his material um, has only gone a short distance, but he has found one on the beach. So it, it does take off. What he found is the big take home thing what we've always used in all of our large wood projects what's the size of the basin? If you're in a 7,000 acre basin or less, you're probably pretty safe putting in whole trees. They're not going to move very far. You might get a tenth to quarter mile movement, it would be a big movement. But once you start getting into the 10,000 acre drainage, then you can start getting into a mile, two miles, much larger. So, yeah, there has been some of those studies. Dave, I see the last question. Uh, John, I'm kind of wondering what the future is for people like me. We had three-quarter mile of stream with NIMP standard of material since building on one project after another since the mid-90s. And we lost probably uh, two-thirds of it. And, you know, we're not going to get a helicopter project in there. What can I do? I mean, am I going to keep putting wood back in there and, you know, from one project <coughs> to the next and lose it again? Nobody's contributing wood upstream that I'm getting. <laughs> but I'm losing it. It's, really it's kind of an easy one to answer that. You know, socially, you know, we want all of these great habitats and salmon everywhere. Unless it's going to impact us and our properties. Now, it doesn't, it's not for everybody, but, you know, a lot of people will say, great, if you just have your way with the stream, throw it full of whatever you want. Other people say, great, do that, as long as it doesn't affect them. Mm -hmm. I think in your situation, Dave, if you wanted it again, you, given the Chickahominy um, status of that stream and ownership patterns, what I would say is you're probably stuck with going back every 10, 15, 20 years and putting in new material. When that breaks loose and exits the system, you're pretty much stuck with going back. Like you said, you're not going to get a helicopter project up there unless you top link out of some trees. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think you're going to be right back into those very engineered, shorter sticks, things that can be placed with excavators and very much an engineered type of approach. And it, it pains me greatly you know, to say that. But like, uh, I think, given where you're at up there, I think that's what I see down the road. All right, well, I'm going to have to go Sorry. Elder Creek Project in the Lakes Basin, the Lower Deadwood Project um, in, that's called Lower Deadwood, really um, where the placements are on the West Fork and Misery, and um, also on the rather substantial Knowles Creek Project that was the stimulus funded project that on those three, and jump in the land, the Deadwood landowners, if you have anything to add, from, this, um, from the work that either Paul or I have done going out and looking at those um, projects, the wood has, um, has not traveled too far on the, any of those projects, and um, where it did travel, it traveled a reasonable, or a short distance, did exactly what John's talking about, maybe moved down to the next structure, or um, hung up a little ways later, and that it, um, those sites were all still functioning. Um, no one's had a chance to go through all of Knowles Creek because one of the things the storms did is um, blew out part of the road on an um, undersized culvert, and we'll hopefully be partnering to work on that. But um, so there still needs to be some surveys up there. But it's um, those projects are all responding well, and so that was that was pretty cool to go out there and see the to see the 
several of those. Um, so great, thank you. It looks like we have no one signed up for open mic. Are there any now?